Hello everyone, and welcome to History 1151, United States Civilization to 1877. In this video, we will be discussing the first inhabitants of what will become known as the United States of America. We will consider the first humans to arrive in the Americas, who are commonly referred to as Native Americans or Indians today. After we have discussed the Americas' first inhabitants, we will discuss how these people established the cultures that encountered European explorers during the Age of Exploration in late 1400s Common Era. So who were the first people who came to the Americas? How did they get here? What was their culture like? These are all questions that we're going to tackle in the next few slides. Most scholars believed that the ancestors of modern day Native Americans arrived on the North American continent between 12,000 and 15,000 years ago. Some people believe that America's first humans arrived as early as 20,000 to 40,000 years ago, but the majority of these people, called Paleo-Indians by scholars, arrived during the later set of dates that I just mentioned. Why did the Paleo-Indians come to the Americas when they did? About 15,000 years ago, the Earth was in the midst of the last Great Ice Age. A Great Ice Age occurs when the global temperature drops so low that the Earth's far northern and southern hemispheres will experience severe glaciation. That is, they will be covered with glaciers. These glaciers in the western hemisphere extend as far south as present-day Ohio. It is important to note that Earth has also experienced countless mini ice ages which have a much smaller effect on the global climate, but can have a significant impact on the development of human cultures and civilizations. Anyway, back to the Paleo-Indians. As a side effect of increased glaciation, the global sea level was far lower than it is today, and Eastern Asia, present-day Russia and Siberia, was connected to what is now Alaska via a land bridge called Beringia. But is currently covered in water by the present-day Bering Straits. These Paleo-Indians probably walked across Beringia, but some scholars think that they may have used canoes or other primitive boats as well, allowing them to travel more quickly and easily. The relative ease at which humans could travel over water before the development of steam power and internal combustion engines will be a major theme in this course, so keep this point in mind as we go forward. Some scholars have proposed an alternate explanation for how the America's first people came here. They propose that the America's first human residents came from what is now Europe using small boats. This explanation is called the Salutrian Hypothesis. Scholars who advocate for the Salutrian Hypothesis argue that the first humans to arrive in the Americas used spear points that bore similarities to those used by the Salutrian culture that inhabited what is now Western Europe between 21,000 and 17,000 years ago. This hypothesis has not been confirmed by genetic discoveries, as human remains have not been found in the same layers of earth strata as the spear points. So the most evidence-based descriptions for the origins of America's first people remains the Beringian explanation we discussed previously. We will move forward in this course, assuming that the Beringian explanation is true. So what were the Paleo-Indians, the people who came to the Americas via Siberia, actually like? Scholars think that they were not a single monolithic group, and that they came over in waves over the course of a few thousand years. They also think that these disparate Paleo-Indian groups may have spoken different languages, and that they would have had different physical appearances and skin tones, although most scholars agree, based on genetic studies of Paleo-Indian remains, these people generally had dark eyes, black hair, and a copper-colored skin tone, like most modern-day Native Americans. Scholars also agree that these migrations stopped roughly 10,000 years ago with the end of the last Great Ice Age, the melting of the glaciers, and the subsequent rise in sea level, flooding the Beringian land bridge. A good example of what the average Paleo-Indian might have looked like can be found in the study of the Kennewick Man, 
a roughly 9,000-year-old human skeleton found in present-day Washington State in 1996. An international team of scientists completed genetic profiles and forensic anthropological studies on the Kennewick man's remains and were able to recreate how he would have looked when he was alive. Notice his dark hair and eyes and his ruddy skin tone. The scientists determined that the Kennewick man had DNA that coincided primarily with modern Native Americans, as well as some East Asians, including the Ainu people, who used to inhabit Japan's northern islands. After genetic tests were completed, it was determined that the Kennewick man was closely related to modern-day Native Americans. Thus, the U.S. government gave custody of the remains to several Native American tribes living in modern-day Washington who laid Kennewick Man to rest according to their own rituals in 2017. Now we will talk a little more about what kind of technologies the Paleo-Indians brought with them to the Americas and how these texts evolved over time to become important parts of the lifeways of many different Native American cultures. The Paleo-Indians were hunter-gatherers, meaning they, they gained their subsistence by hunting wild game fishing, and collecting wild fruits and vegetables. To this end, the Paleo-Indians practiced a seasonal, semi-nomadic migration style, following the herds and the seasons. When many people hear the term hunter-gatherer today, they think of primitive, antediluvian cultures that cannot compete with more sedentary agricultural societies, the so-called civilizations. What scholars have found, however, is that these supposedly primitive hunter-gatherer societies were actually very well organized and that their technology for the time was very adaptable and sophisticated using natural resources that were readily available in the environments in which these people lived. For example, consider the spear points made by Paleo-Indians, particularly those of the Clovis culture. These points were sharp perfect for killing large game like bison and now extinct woolly mammoths, camels, and giant armadillos and sloths, all of which died off due to the end of the last great ice age about 10,000 years ago in the Americas. The climate of the Americas during the great ice age was probably more diverse than it is today with arid deserts, damp rainforests, and cold tundra existing in close proximity in what some scholars call a plaid environment. Points like those found amongst the Clovis culture have been found across what is now the U.S. and even as far south as Chile and South America, attesting to the popularity and utility of these tools in the harsh environments of the Americas. Paleo-Indians and their Native American descendants also use sophisticated traps to capture and slow down wild game as well, allowing them to go in for the kill, as you can see on this slide with the hunting of the woolly mammoth. As the Paleo-Indians expanded across North and South America, they began to develop new lifeways and survival techniques suited to the environments in which they had settled. Native Americans' numbers grew significantly over time. It is estimated by the year 1500 of the Common Era, eight years after Columbus's first voyage, the indigenous population of North and South America had reached nearly 55 million people. The vast majority of these people lived in Mesoamerica and the Andes Mountains. The region that includes what is now the U.S. and Canada was less densely settled and probably had a population of about 3.8 million. In 1500, North and South America had a population density of about three people per square mile. To put this into perspective, Europe in 1500, with a population of about 62 million people, was more densely populated with about 16 people per square mile. Indigenous populations across all of the Americas would decline steeply after the arrival of Europeans due to disease, warfare, exploitation, dispossession. But we will discuss these issues in later videos. The regional cultural adaptations made by the descendants of the Paleo-Indians would give rise to the diverse Native American cultures that encountered the European explorers in the 14 and 1500s. One of the most important developments in these early Native American cultures was the 
adoption of agriculture, primarily through the domestication of corn, or as it was originally called, maize. Maize was first domesticated about 7,000 years ago in Mesoamerica, roughly in what is now Mexico. For perspective, Neolithic people in the Old World began practicing agriculture about 10,000 years ago, which is only slightly earlier than the Paleo-Indians in the grand scheme of human history. Mesoamerican hunter-gatherers discovered that the Teosinte grass produced edible seeds, and through selective breeding, these people became farmers, breeding the Teosinte that produced the largest seed pods, eventually giving rise to the corn we know today, roughly. Corn cobs, some of which are as small as strawberries, have been found in caves in Mexico, dating to about 4,000 years before the Common Era. Maize domestication is spread north to what would become the United States, first in the American Southwest, roughly what is now Arizona, about 4,000 years ago. It arrived in the eastern U.S. about 1,500 years ago, although some scholars debate these dates. In addition to maize, which formed the bedrock of Native American agriculture, America's indigenous peoples domesticated over 100 other plant species. In the Andes Mountains, the ancestors of the Incan peoples domesticated potatoes between 8 and 10,000 years ago. And the peoples of Mesoamerica domesticated chili peppers and tomatoes 6,000 and 600 years ago, respectively. The most important agricultural productions to Native Americans, after maize corn, were gourds and beans. Gourds, including squash, were domesticated before corn, probably about 10,000 years ago, and beans were domesticated much later, perhaps around 2000 BCE. Both of these plants were first domesticated in the Andes and Mesoamerica and spread north to what would become the U.S. The Native Americans of the Midwest, namely the Cahokian people who inhabited the Mississippi River Valley, were one of the first progenitors of three sisters planting, a type of companion agriculture in which farmers grew maize, squash, and beans together in the same fields. Corn, while a critical cereal grain for Native Americans, depleted the soil of nitrogen, a critical mineral that plants needed in order to grow properly. Beans added nitrogen back to the soil, allowing Native American farmers to farm their fields without having to leave them fallow without cultivation. To regenerate their nutrients, as is done in cultures that practice one crop agriculture. Additionally, corn, while easily stored and high in carbohydrates, does not provide a balanced diet when eaten alone. It is low in protein and fatty acids and lacks critical nutrients like niacin. Beans and squash, however, made up for the corn's shortfalls, allowing Native American agriculturalists who used the Three Sisters method of planting to be far healthier than societies which did not, as testified by studies done on human remains from Native American cultures. Although agriculture offered many benefits, not all Native American peoples took up intensive farming. Some chose to stick to time-honored hunter-gatherer subsistence models. The societies that did adopt agriculture, however, developed very differently from their hunter-gatherer neighbors. As was the case in the Old World, agriculture created food surpluses. Cereal grains, while low in certain nutrients, could be grown fairly easily and could be stored for future use, creating resource surpluses. As was also the case in the Old World, these surpluses allowed agricultural societies to specialize, as not everyone in that community had to dedicate all of their time to the procurement of food, as is necessary in hunter-gatherer societies. A few skilled farmers could feed an entire community allowing their neighbors to specialize in other skills, becoming builders, warriors, priests, or artisans. Those who secured the food resources and issued them to the people would become the Native American community's elite classes, giving rise to what scholars have called civilization. When I say the word civilization, 
you probably think of a society that is refined, innovative, and cultured. You might conjure up images of quote-unquote advanced and sophisticated societies. Perhaps you think of quote-unquote Western civilizations, like the ancient Greeks or Romans. Or maybe you think of the U.S. civilization with its scientific and cultural achievements. What I am proposing is a more broad definition of, of civilization. A society or people group becomes a civilization when it has the resources and division of labor to create things like monumental architecture and fine arts. When it can establish cities, develop religions, and exhibit social hierarchies. Cultures that have achieved one or more of these things are deemed civilized. By this definition, many Native American cultures achieved civilization. They developed agricultural techniques that allowed for the saving of resources, and they used those resources to build architecture of a monumental nature and to create divisions of labor and eventually social stratification. It is also worth noting that while civilizations are able to achieve great things, there are many downsides to living in a civilization versus living in a hunter-gatherer society. In a civilization, social hierarchies exist in a way that they cannot in hunter-gatherer societies, and economic inequality tends to worsen over time as the elite accumulates more resources in civilizations. One of the greatest technological developments of civilizations, written language, was developed to help the elite collect taxes and resources from the commoners in exchange for protection and administration. Some Native American cultures, like the Aztecs, Inca, and Maya, developed written languages for this purpose, as well as the propagation of their culture. The Native American peoples of North America, although they achieved civilization, did not use written languages like their neighbors in Central and South America. Life could be very difficult for lower class people in these Native American civilizations. Anthropological evidence, studies done on their skeletal remains, suggest that the poor had hard lives. Their bones show they suffer from malnutrition, arthritis, and joint damage from a life of hard work, as well as wounds sustained in battle. So, civilization offered Native Americans many of the same benefits that it offered peoples of the old world but it also presented many of the same drawbacks. With this knowledge of civilizations in mind, let's consider some of North America's largest and most representative Native American cultures, those that utilized civilization and those that did not. In the North American Southwest, the first place that maize was domesticated Indian tribes developed an agricultural system that adapted to the aridity of the southwestern climate. One of the ways they did this was through the construction of irrigation networks. Using these networks, they grew maize and other crops in the river valleys. The women of these societies oversaw agriculture and the men of these societies oversaw hunting and warfare a common gender-based division of labor across many North American societies. The Southwestern Indians developed a religious belief system that venerated the sky and the earth. They saw the sky with its rain as masculine and the earth in which they tilled their seed as feminine. Southwestern people like the Anasazi the ancestors of modern Zuni and Navajo tribes achieved a high level of civilization, building secure cliffside settlements or pueblos that, while difficult to construct, were highly defensible, allowing them to protect their people and their food resources. For example, the Pueblo of Chaco Canyon, present day New Mexico, required over 30,000 tons of sandstone bricks in its construction attesting to the Anasazi's keen ability to gather resources to feed their workers and divert labor from food production to construction. While the Anasazi built spectacular settlements, 
Their dependence on agriculture made them vulnerable to changes in the climate, which, combined with threats from other warring Native Americans, caused their culture to disappear around the year 1300 of the Common Era. The Anasazi's reliance on agricultural actually made them, in some ways, more vulnerable than hunter-gatherer societies, which could have migrated to regions with more abundant food resources in a time of climate change. Further to the east, Native Americans of the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys developed their own form of civilization. These peoples established settlements around high, man-made earth mounds. These large mounds, as seen at a variety of sites in the eastern U.S., attest to these cultures' ability to save resources and mobilize their people for large construction projects. One of the oldest and largest of these mounds was built at Poverty Point in what is now Louisiana. Poverty Point's bird mound, a massive avian-shaped earthwork, is over 72 feet high. It was built around 1400 BCE. Further to the north and east in our neck of the woods, the Hopewell people built their own large mounds. The Hopewell's most famous mound, which is in Newark, Ohio, was built between 100 BCE and 400 CE. The Hopewell constructed the Newark earthworks as a ceremonial and religious site where the people would gather at certain times of the year to measure the paths of the sun and the moon and to bury their honored dead as well. This site was not continuously settled. The Hopewell religion put a high emphasis on ancestor worship and reverence for the dead. The Hopewell made intricate mica and hammered copper artwork for trade and to bury with their deceased, whose remains they carried with them until they could be interred in burial mounds around the Newark earthworks. The Hopewell were a semi-nomadic people that focused on trading and traveling by water, but they adopted maize agriculture toward the end of their civilization's existence. Around the year 1000 of the Common Era, the mound building civilizations collapsed and were replaced by the more militant Mississippian culture, which, instead of mounds, focused on building large earth pyramids. The Mississippian pyramid builders, including the Fort Ancient culture, which replaced the Hopewell, and the Cahokian people, who built a settlement at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, were more warlike than their predecessors. The Cahokia and the Fort Ancient used new technologies, like the bow and arrow, to overwhelm the more peaceful mound builders, who used less powerful atlatls to defend themselves. Human remains from the period attest to the Mississippians' keen military strength. Additionally, Mississippians like the Cahokia and the Fort Ancient were far more sedentary than the mound builders. The Mississippians constructed large, permanently settled, fortified cities near the earthen pyramids that they built. In contrast, the mound builders had been semi-nomadic and would only congregate at their ceremonial earthworks at certain times of the year to trade and bury their dead. The Mississippians were sedentary enough to build large cities, and their social systems bore a strong resemblance to the class hierarchies of the Native Americans of Mesoamerica, namely the Maya and the Aztecs. The Mississippians practiced agriculture, built cities and pyramids, fought wars, and practiced large-scale human sacrifice as well. The Mississippian elite used human sacrifice as a tool to motivate the commoners to fight in their wars and to keep the people from toppling the rule of the upper class by distracting them with the spectacle of the sacrifices. Evidence suggests that the Mississippian elite looked down on their own people, referring to the commoners as stinkards, much like the Mesoamerican elite, who also demeaned their underclass. The Mississippian fine art was heavily influenced by Mesoamerica as well, with jaguars and falcons being common motifs in their artwork, as was common in the Mayan and Aztec cultures as well. 
Additionally, like their Hopewell predecessors, the Mississippians worked copper, but they did not smelt metal. The peoples of Mesoamerica, in contrast to the Mississippians, practiced metallurgy, the smelting of metal, and they developed written language, also something the Mississippians did not do. By the 1500s, the Mississippian culture had begun to decline due to internecine warfare and diseases that had been unwittingly introduced by the first waves of European colonizers. Several modern Native American nations, including the Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, and Osage peoples, claim the Mississippians as their ancestors, although their cultures are quite different from their forebears, leading some 19th century Euro-Americans to believe a people distinct from Native Americans had built the earthen monuments that dotted the American heartland. On North America's northeast coast, the Eastern Woodlands peoples developed lifeways that combine elements of the hunter-gatherer culture and agricultural civilization. The Eastern Woodland peoples, ancestors of modern Native American groups like the Algonquin and the Iroquois, hunted in the region's woodlands, fished in rivers and along the coast, and gathered wild plants as well. They also practiced agriculture, including the Three Sisters method. It should be noted that the people of the coastal southeast inhabiting what is now coastal Georgia and Florida, along with the Native Americans who inhabited the American West Coast, shared many cultural similarities with the Eastern Woodland people, especially their combination of the agricultural and hunter-gatherer lifestyles. Additionally, the Eastern Woodlanders shared some cultural similarities with the Southwestern Indians, especially when it came to gender-based divisions of labor. Both groups made women responsible for agriculture. Eastern woodlanders lived in tree bark longhouses, called lodges or wigwams, which could be taken apart and moved, depending on the season. Eastern woodlanders also traveled across the region by water, using canoes made from birch bark or hollowed out tree trunks, called dugout canoes. Eastern woodlanders hunted deer and turkeys, and caught fish and gathered crustaceans, adding protein to their diets, since they, unlike the Native Americans of Mesoamerica, in South America did not practice animal husbandry, the raising of animals for food, milk, or fibers. Warfare was an important part of the lifeways of the Eastern Woodland peoples, who fought each other seasonally to capture resources and to take captives. These captives, if they were women or children, would be adopted into the tribe, but military-aged male captives were often killed in ritual sacrifices, often by being burned alive. These torturous executions gave the families of warriors who had been killed in battle a chance to take ceremonial vengeance for their lost brothers, husbands, sons, and fathers. Some of these peoples also included cannibalism in these rituals, allowing the surviving warriors to consume the power of their executed captives. While these rituals seem brutal, even barbaric to us today, they helped to prevent long-standing blood feuds between tribal groups. They also disincentivized the Eastern Woodlands peoples from seeking to conquer enemy tribes in battle by giving them the chance to experience small-scale personal vengeance on captured warriors. Eastern Woodlanders recognized that a destroyed enemy could not be fought again and thus could not provide additional victory spoils or captives in the future. Over time, small eastern woodlands bands began to join together, creating the large tribes and confederations that Europeans first witnessed when they arrived in America. Like the mound builders and the southwestern Native Americans, the eastern woodlands people had complex spiritual beliefs. They gave reverence to the dead and they engaged in rituals that would protect their crops and ensure that they grew well. The Eastern Woodlands people used tobacco in their religious rituals. Their tobacco had a lower nicotine content than the leaf that is commonly smoked in America today, and it probably had hallucinogenic properties as well, somewhat like cannabis. Because they moved seasonally, the Eastern Woodland people did not believe in the owning of land. They believed that people had the right to work the land, either hunting or growing crops on it, 
but the idea that land should be divided and permanently parceled out to individual owners, as was more common in European cultures, was alien to them. These differing views on land use would lead to future struggles between Native Americans and Europeans. In the American Midwest and Great Plains, Native American life was profoundly different before the introduction of the horse by the Spanish colonizers. Before the arrival of horses, the Plains Indians, the ancestors of people like the Lakota Sioux, were semi-nomadic horticulturalists, growing small gardens and hunting large game, primarily bison. Without horses, the Plains people developed some ingenious methods for hunting bison and other fast and powerful game animals. The Plains hunters would camouflage themselves in buffalo skins and trick the bison into coming close and letting down their guard, where they could be more easily killed with spears and bows and arrows. They would also drive the bison off cliffs where their prey would fall to its death. In this slide, you can see an image of plains people driving buffalo off a cliff, although you'll see them using horses. Because of the difficulty and danger associated with hunting bison, both before and after the introduction of horses, plains hunters found uses for every part of the buffalo. Its meat and organs were eaten, its blood could be used to make paint, and its bones and skins could be used to fabricate clothing and shelters, portable tent lodges called teepees. Before the arrival of horses, the Plains Indians used dogs as beasts of burden to help them move their settlements. Horses were much stronger and faster than dogs and could bear riders, allowing Plains hunters to hunt bison from horseback as well as travel greater distances during the year. In this way, the Plains people actually became less sedentary over time, in contrast to other Native American peoples we have discussed before, whose lifeways became more static over time. We have covered a tremendous amount of information about the people who inhabited the Americas before the arrival of Europeans, and we've really only scratched the surface of this subject. As you can see, Native American culture and lifeways varied greatly depending on region and time, from the first Paleo-Indians to the Mississippian, Eastern woodland, and Plains cultures that Europeans witnessed when they arrived in North America. Native American culture was incredibly diverse and not a monolith. Indeed, the idea that Amerindians were a single people was a European construction. For most of their history, America's first peoples did not think of themselves as a single ethnic or racial group. Native Americans would not begin to think of themselves this way until at the earliest, the 19th century. But we will discuss this change in attitude in future videos. Even though Native American peoples had drastically different life ways, based on the environments in which they lived and the resources they had access to. I hope that during this video, you also saw there were some important commonalities between these disparate Amerindian groups. One commonality between Native Americans was the prevalence of religious beliefs that emphasized humanity's connection with nature. The people of the Southwest, the mound building and Mississippian cultures, and the Eastern Woodlands peoples practiced rituals that honored the earth to ensure that it provided rains to water their crops especially maize. What I also hoped that you saw was that Native American gender relations were different than those of the Europeans who migrated to the Americas. Although a gendered labor division existed amongst Native Americans, women had responsibilities that were unheard of amongst European cultures until the 20th century. I also hope that you saw that Native Americans, like Europeans, also held and continue to hold their dead in high regard. They had important rituals surrounding the commemoration and burial of their deceased, even ancestors from thousands of years ago, like the Kennewick man. Finally, I hope that you saw that warfare was common and even an important part of life for Native Americans, especially those that lived in the Mississippian cultures and amongst the Eastern Woodlanders. I bring up this point because many people from a variety of perspectives and backgrounds operate under the assumption that life for Native Americans before the arrival of Europeans was idyllic in an Eden-like paradise. In fact, life was very difficult for many indigenous people as climates change, 
wars persisted, and commoners labored to support the elite. This belief that Native American life was idyllic was often driven by the quote-unquote noble savage stereotype. The noble savage stereotype was an ethnocentric belief developed by Europeans, which alleged that Native Americans were weak and childlike, living in a perfect land without having to work to survive. This mentality was used to justify wars against Native American tribes, encroaching on the land that they occupied, and eventually the acculturation of Native Americans in favor of European customs. We'll talk about all these issues in later videos.